So at the end of the 1800s, there was nearly a thousand independent gun makers in Birmingham. That's a lot. And as such, you see many cyber sides featuring many, many, many different names. And not all of them fascinate me, but this one certainly tickled my fancy, so I sat down and did a bit of research. These are the guns of E. Roberts. So interestingly enough, although these two guns bear the same name, they couldn't be much more different. They are fairly different, but both have had very interesting lives. The first thing I say is I have a suspicion of which one is younger, but this one is devoid of serial numbers, original serial numbers. So I couldn't tell you much. What I can tell you is a little bit about E. Roberts. E. Roberts, or Edgar Roberts, took over the business from his father, his father, Joseph Thomas Roberts, was established, I believe, or first recorded in 1873 at 39 Lower Loveday Street in Birmingham. In 1902, he either died or retired, either way his name was expunged from the gunmaker's list, and his son Edgar took over, stopping in 1936. Address-wise, this particular one is stamped both 22 Weeman Street and 141 Steelhouse Lane. The 22 Weeman Street address is from about 1900, and the 141 Steel House Lane was 1903 to 1923, uh, and they seem to end their career at the rear of 22 Bath Street. Before all of this, and I would have thought that would be marked as J. Roberts, as opposed to E. Roberts, you'll find them at 5 Steel House Lane. 5 Steel House Lane, which is where they were from 1897 to 1901. A couple other various facts about E. Roberts before we start is this, is that he was much more likely to have been a finisher or, an, or than a retailer rather than an actual builder himself. Obviously, with nearly a thousand gun makers in London around that, or in Birmingham around that time, and an ever dwindling number thereafter, there was a lot of share and share aliking. You literally could go next door to another gun maker and get a bit or get another bit. And why would you create everything yourself in a small workshop when Matey Boy Next Door has all of the tools to build quality barrels and you have all of the tools to build quality stocks and your mate produces locks that are very reasonable? Um, and occasionally you change your lock supplier or, or so on and so forth. And to be honest also, you think about through this time, times were changing as well. So you wouldn't want to invest vast amounts of money in anything because things were changing so quickly. One source I said, and it's the least reliable source because it's Wikipedia, says that it is a specialized in walking stick guns, although I could find no backup for that whatsoever. But it's Wikipedia, so it's not going to be a lie. The final bit is that E. Roberts produced their own in-house cartridges called the Reliance and the forward, and they are named as E. Roberts Practical Gunmaker on all the packaging. So, but what do we have here, you ask? Well, we have two guns. Let's not start with this one. This is the nicer of the pair, although this in itself has had some serious work done. But you don't get guns from 100 years ago that haven't had a lot of work done. This is the more confusing of the two and I believe is the earlier of the two as well. Just through a couple of certain bits, the locking safety, the lock style and design, you know, it's got that sort of hint of Rigby about it. And there is, in fact, later on, Roberts owned Rigby, so who knows? It is an interesting lock design in that the other one is way more common on garden. It feels a little bit earlier. The safety catch, everything about it, the engraving style, it feels a little bit earlier. But on both of these, interestingly, you have a little game scene. On this one, you have some kind of pointery setting spaniel dog chasing a couple of partridge. And on the other side, an actual pointer chasing a couple of pheasants. It is a beautiful gun. At some point during this gun's life, firstly, there's no serial number in the forend, which is odd. Secondly, the serial number on the trigger guard there has been worn off. You can just about make out some numbers, but not enough to give you an actual accurate thing. There's definitely a seven, and a five and a two, and there's a zero at the end, but you know, that's just speculation because actually there's some marks further on that it could be anything, it could be anything. So all this gun has got is one serial number here, 24189, and that is the barrels. These barrels are 
Interestingly, really not exciting barrels. New barrels by Midland Gun Company, Birmingham. They are not, uh, they're a well-made pair of barrels. They're straight. They're pretty dull, but they're, they're well finished. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? It's, so I have a touch of history on this gun that it was given to a chap who was an, a gamekeeper back in the day, and that's been handed down through the generations until it was condemned, unfortunately. Or condemned, given up. No one in the family wanted it, which I always think is heartbreaking. So I don't know whether this gun ever had enough value for them to have bought a half-decent set of barrels or whether it was just the fact that they were in Birmingham. Midland Gun Company was the biggest and probably the cheapest person to make barrels for them. Who knows? This is pure speculation. What is interesting, however, is that if you look at the bottom of this gun, and it's had a fair life, they've had a whole segment here welded up and then finished over. I mean, I can't really say anything about it or why the hell anyone would have done that, but... These sort of little historical repairs that just add some character to a gun. And we will go inside the locks on both of these guns in a separate members video because I would like to look inside and I'd like to share that with you just to see what the actual mechanical differences are. Anyway, there is no original serial number and that is it. It is, however, quite beautiful. The wood is really nothing that exciting. It's got flat point checkering. The engraving is of a really nice standard. Somebody's had this pin out, the cross pin out, or rejointed it at some point but it's, it's fairly, somebody's tried to rejoin it at some point perhaps. It is what it is. A beautiful piece of history with nil value, really, or very limited value. This next one is a little bit more interesting. And I love any time anyone has spent serious money on guns because it just shows that there was, at some point in our history, a different sort of relationship with guns. I know that's probably a little bit silly, but nowadays, people just scrap guns and they get bad and buy a new one. But back then, people understood, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. There you go. I'm just sentimental about it. But this gun here, so the stock is original. The checkering has moved from a flat point style to a finer checkering, but still in a flat point, interestingly. The locks, and this is, the locks are a completely different shape and style. Quite interesting with this sort of rounded segment here and the bead defences are not that exciting, but it's this interested rounded lock plate. I say it's interesting. It is interesting. That is interesting. The trigger guard has a huge dent in it. The gun in itself is not that in great order, by the by. And there is no serial number on the trigger guard on this one either. Although this one never had one, the other one did. Unless So there is a pointy dog on the trigger guard. You have a small game scene, a couple of pheasants on one side of the lock. And... Couple of black grouse on the other side. So, interestingly, the colour hardening on this gun is not original. I should really use a nicer pointer, I might make one. Um, and you can tell that because there's certain areas of the engraving that has clearly been like worn off, polished to get it back to a half decent standard and then put together. Also, some of these pins are just protruding that a little bit too much. I like that somebody has recased colour hardened this gun. That in itself shows that somebody cared enough to have it aesthetically revamped. Thereafter, it has been rejointed. Uh, and this is kind of the weird part, is that somebody's rejointed it, color hardened it, but they're not engraved this little disc here. I mean, I can't really logic that one out, but you know, we all cut corners in places and if you've only got 200 quid and it's 250 quid repair, where are you gonna cut the repair? where it counts or where it doesn't. And everyone, when I'm doing these videos about broken guns goes, yeah, well, it doesn't matter, just rejoint it and go. And I suppose that was this attitude right here. The stock is cracked on this one. You've got crack running down through there. It's been repaired a little bit, but it's opened up at the top. And there is a little crack actually been repaired, but running all the way down through the hand there and down to about here. The Damascus on this, and this is a polar opposite. This is an extremely English and very fine quality Damascus. By comparison to that little American jobber we looked at, looked at last week, that actually this is an extremely English pattern. Um, I actually held the two together earlier and it's fascinating. Um, I don't know which one I prefer. I think the, that consistency, the, I mean, and it is a very pure consistency that runs through every single ring on this Damascus does weird things to me. On the American gun, it was just quite big and flashy. I mean, who knows? 
who knows? Four-end styles change, although I do feel like this four-end is nowhere near original. The way that it's fitted wood to metal, the checkering is sound, well, the checkering matches, but the headwork and everything on this stock does not match the quality of the forend. Um, and certainly the quality of the gun doesn't match the nature of the forend. This forend is way more of a Midland Gun Company style forend, I suppose. Which begs the question, if the iron is original, what happened to the woodwork and barrels? I'm sure there's a great story that I never will, will never guess. I always feel like I should make great stories up at this point, but I haven't yet. They have case hardened the forend iron in there as well. That's quite nice. And this is a much more classic style of forend. I am a big fan. Anyway, there is a little bit of information about Jay Roberts and a couple of absolutely beautiful guns. That um, yeah, are relatively worthless. But it is Nice, like I said, to see. This gun's been rebrowned, rehardened. The stock was refinished at some point and then has received a good few years of abuse. You know, it's just a little bit of history. Guys, thank you very much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed this, this little look into a relatively obscure and hopefully never forgotten about Birmingham Gunmaker.